This is the story of two Prime Ministers, David Cameron, who in 2009 said he would transfer power from politicians to people, and Keir Starmer, who was in charge of the Crown Prosecution Service when mistakes made by the CPS stopped that transfer of power happening. The cover-up that followed appears to have gone to the top of the criminal justice system. It must be the biggest legal scandal in British history. But first, let's listen to David Cameron. We will begin a massive redistribution of power in our country, from the powerful to the powerless, from the political elite to the man and the woman in the street. Local control over schools, housing and policing. The right to initiate local and national referenda. Hang on a minute. What was that? The right to initiate local and national referenda. OK. We need to understand exactly what it means when Cameron says he will allow people to initiate national referenda. If people can initiate national referendums, this means they can propose a new law, call a national referendum on that proposal, and if they succeed, that proposal becomes law. All this can be done without having to ask permission from Parliament, politicians or any other body. It means the people are the sovereign power in the country, not Parliament. The best example we have of this working is Switzerland, where people can initiate referendums by collecting 100,000 signatures from their fellow citizens within 18 months. If they can do that, then a binding referendum must be held on their proposal. What Cameron is saying is that he will introduce that Swiss system here and end hundreds of years of parliamentary sovereignty. That's extraordinary. Why did he say that, even though his party had never even discussed it? He was prepositioning the Conservative Party, getting ahead of a campaign that very few people in this country knew about. Campaign for Democracy. A campaign that had found a way of forcing that system into place. Millions of people might vote in a general election, but when the polls are close, as they were in 2010, the result can be decided by a few thousand people floating voters in marginal seats. What are floating voters in marginal seats? Floating voters are people with no strong party allegiance. They'll vote for whichever party they think will make the best government at the time of the election. Most people vote for the same party every election, but floating voters will switch between parties. And marginal seats? Most seats are safe seats. The same party wins it every election, but marginal seats are ones that switch between the parties and are sometimes won by tens or hundreds of votes. When the race is close, these are the places where elections are won or lost. In 1992, John Major had a majority of just 21 seats. If he'd lost 11 of them, then no majority. In those 11 seats, he won by around 1,200 votes. If six or 700 voting voters in the marginal seats had voted differently, John Major would have lost the 1992 election. Another example was in 2017, when Theresa May lost by around 800 votes. If you can get floating voters in marginal seats to unite behind a fair and reasonable demand, such as a transfer of power from politicians to people, then the politicians are going to have to give them what they want, because they can never be sure what the other parties will do. In 2009, David Cameron knew that Campaign for Democracy had been prepared and was ready to run. He knew I was talking to people who could give me the money I needed to run it, so he pre-positioned the Conservatives in that speech to make them look good for when the campaign was announced. That was the real big society. So why didn't the campaign run? Why didn't we get the real big society? Mistakes made by people in the criminal justice system led to me, Graham MacArthur, the founder of the campaign, being involved in miscarriages of justice and wrongful imprisonments. That stopped the campaign going ahead. The campaign is challenging, it's a big idea, and so it's not easy to get it started. If the founder of the campaign is a convicted criminal, that makes it impossible to get it off the ground. Once people in the criminal justice system realised that this had happened, and how damaging this would be for the system, attempts were made to cover up the mistakes in order to protect the reputation of the legal professions. That's quite a claim, but in the criminal justice system, everything is done in writing. All the documents that prove my claims are true can be seen on my website. The problem started with mistakes made by the Crown Prosecution Service, the CPS, in 2009. If the CPS had done its job properly, the original case against me, common assault, would never have gone to court, and Campaign for Democracy would have been run and won in 2010. The person in charge of the CPS at that time was Keir Starmer. 
The process that takes a person to court is straightforward. A crime is reported, the police collect statements from witnesses and other evidence and pass the case to the CPS. The CPS goes over the evidence to see if there's a reasonable chance of obtaining a conviction and if there is, the case goes to court, with the CPS being responsible for the prosecution. In my case, two people claimed I assaulted one of them and there were four independent prosecution witnesses. Six against one, the one being me. Yet I claim I was framed. Well, not only do I claim that, I also claim that the evidence from the four independent prosecution witnesses supports my claims. It's very easy to prove. All you have to do is lay out the evidence in a simple table. There are three columns in this table. In the centre column, I put the allegations made against me by the person who claims he was assaulted and his partner, his partner being an ex of mine. As you can see, every allegation made is referenced to a page in a highlighted section of the written statements they made to the police. All the documents are on this website, so anyone can check this. Now, the other two columns. In the right-hand column, we put all the extracts from the statements from the independent prosecution witnesses that contradict the allegations made against me. In the left-hand column, we put the evidence that supports the allegations made against me. As you can see, there's a problem. Every allegation made against me can be shown to be false. It's not that one or two points in the prosecution case are a bit dodgy. It's everything. On the other hand, there is no evidence, none at all, that supports the allegations made against me. Yet the CPS chose to take me to court when it's obvious my two opponents should have been prosecuted for attempting to pervert the course of justice. It's not as if there's any shortage of evidence. But I was the one who was prosecuted and convicted. So what went wrong? Again, it's very simple. If someone hits you and then you push them away and sit on them to restrain them, but no one sees you being hit, they only see you pushing the other person away and sitting on them, those witnesses will think you're doing the attacking. You can see that's what's happened from the witness statements and other evidence. But the thing is, my accusers didn't realise other people had seen key moments. Because of that, they lied and exaggerated everything. Because of these exaggerations and lies, they were caught out. But it wasn't the police or the CPS that caught them out. It was me. After the trial, I got copies of the witness statements from the CPS and went through the evidence properly. Going through the statements, statements you can see here on this website, that were collected by the police and given to the CPS. Once I'd done that, I thought it would be easy to fix. There was an automatic right of appeal, and the evidence in the case was clear. All I had to do was set the appeal in motion and send the table and statements to the Crown Prosecution Service. It was obvious I'd been framed, so what should the CPS do? Well, once they checked everything themselves, they should inform the court that they weren't going to oppose the appeal, and the court would then overturn the conviction. That didn't happen. There is an automatic right of appeal, but there's a deadline attached, 21 days. The problem was I had been told there were 28 days in which to appeal and I didn't find out about the 21 days until after the deadline had passed. That meant I would have to get permission to appeal. I wrote to the court explaining the situation, mentioned the table and asked to be allowed to appeal. Leave to appeal was refused, but the letter went further and said my case had no merit. That's bad, but things were about to get a lot worse. From the beginning, I knew my ex regretted framing me. She would want to put things right if she could, so I went to see her before the trial. I was right, she did want to stop the case, but others got involved, so after I was found guilty of common assault, I was then charged with witness interference. That trial was unusual. Halfway through, the judge realised I was innocent, but in spite of efforts by the judge and the prosecuting barrister to help me, I was convicted. The judge, now retired, reserved sentencing for himself, Reserving the case for himself meant that no other judge could deal with the case. At sentencing, the judge is supposed to listen to the arguments for the longest and shortest sentences from the prosecuting and defending barristers, and then deliver the sentence. I expected a sentence of up to 18 months, but the judge broke the rules and sentenced me to six months in prison, a third of the normal sentence. That may well have saved the campaign, but there was a catch. If I appealed and lost, then the sentence could have been put up to 18 months. 
For more on that trial, have a look at the documents on my website. The witness statement the prosecution used against me is there, as are some notes about the statement. As you'll see, there was no case against me, and there was a sound defence. Nevertheless, I was convicted and ended up spending around 10 weeks in prison. After release, I didn't know what to do to begin with. Everything I'd worked for was being destroyed, but then I found out about an organisation called the Criminal Cases Review Commission, the CCRC. This organisation had been set up by Parliament to review potential miscarriages of justice, so in 2011 I sent the assault case to them. Surprisingly, the campaign was moving forward. I'd had meetings with Kirsty Williams, then Lib Dem leader in Wales, Nick Bourne, a barrister and a Conservative leader in Wales, and I'd been down to Labour and Plight headquarters to discuss the campaign. Politicians wouldn't normally meet a convicted criminal, but I put the whole story and the evidence online. The documents you can see here for yourselves on the website, and told them the case would be sent to the CCRC. They decided to meet me. I'd also contacted my ex by email to warn her that things could get a bit difficult, and offered to help. We both made mistakes, but I was then prosecuted for harassment, even though there was nothing in the emails that was offensive. I'd been very careful. In the emails that you can see on the website, I mentioned that the case had gone to the CCRC, and the CPS saw this when they were looking into the allegations of harassment. The CPS then contacted the CCRC and seemed to have misled the commissioner handling the case, Ian Nicholl. About a week before the harassment trial, the CCRC rejected my application because I had provided no evidence that I'd been framed, even though I'd proved every allegation against me was false, as you saw earlier in the video. It simply didn't make sense. I couldn't understand what was going on until the trial. In court, the prosecution asked me if I'd heard from the CCRC. Then I understood. Nicola had been misled by the CPS and thought I was harassing a victim of crime. He had rushed through the application without examining the evidence properly so I could be ambushed in court. The problem for the magistrates was that they had the emails and knew that the only thing in them were warnings to my ex that my name would be cleared. However, they had been told that the CCRC had examined the assault case and rejected my appeal. Of course, the magistrates didn't get a chance to see the evidence in the assault case. After even more mistakes, I ended up in prison again. Mistakes made by the CCRC and the CPS had put an innocent person in prison. We'd gone from failure to fiasco. If you've stuck with this this far, you will have realised when the story comes out, it isn't going to do much for the reputation of the legal professions in Britain. This is an industry that generates over £20 billion a year in fees. It has an international reputation for excellence and it wants to keep it. Would that explain what happened next? In 2009, I decided not to appeal the witness interference case to avoid having my sentence increased to 18 months. By 2013, I was fairly sure that even if an appeal failed, I wouldn't be sent back to prison. I had no idea whether or not that would be the case. I couldn't afford legal advice, but I went ahead and applied for leave to appeal. I can't say what I sent in. The record of that no longer exists, so I can't prove anything at all was sent. But I can prove what was available, what I could have sent to the Court of Appeal. I could have sent all the tables and documents in the assault case that proved that if the police and CPS had examined the evidence properly, the case would never have gone to court. I could have sent the letter from the solicitor that said I had 28 days to appeal and the letter from the judge refusing me leave to appeal. I would have had to send a witness statement in the witness interference case from my ex that clearly showed that all I was trying to do was warn her that life would be awful when the truth came out. I would have then been able to prove that the trial had gone very badly wrong. So badly wrong that the judge had had to severely stretch the rules to make sure I got a sentence well short of the minimum because he knew I was innocent. I could have sent all the evidence in the harassment case that showed the situation had gone from failure to fiasco. If this had happened to someone leading a normal life, perhaps the situation would have been retrievable and justice done, but that wasn't the case. This had happened to someone who had put together an extraordinary campaign, a campaign that would have changed the course of British history 
campaign that had put a Prime Minister in a position where he thought he had to preposition his party in extraordinary ways. All the documents mentioned above could have been sent to the Court of Appeal, along with a video on a DVD that told the story of Campaign for Democracy, what the big society was really about, and how we got the parliamentary petition system. You know the one, a 100,000 signature petition gets you a debate in Parliament. That one. If you're on the website, you'll find a video below about that. I can't prove anything mentioned above was sent. All we can be sure of is that if everything that was available at the time had been sent to the Court of Appeal, those dealing with the case would have realised that the reputation of the British legal professions and system would be devastated when the story came out. Mistake after mistake after mistake had been made, and those mistakes stopped Campaign for Democracy going ahead. So what happened on the 12th of March 2013 in Cardiff courtrooms in court number two, when I asked for leave to appeal? That's one thing we can be sure of. Leave to appeal was refused. The names of the three judges were Males, Milling, and the presiding judge was Sir Brian Leveson. That's Brian Leveson of the Leveson Inquiry. Later in October that year, there was a vacancy for a top job in the criminal justice system, President of the Queen's Bench Division. Leveson got the job, and why not? After all, I'm sure he's a jolly good chap. A week after the Court of Appeal refused me leave to appeal, I sent both the assault case and the witness interference case to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. Enclosed with the application was a letter to the Chief Executive of the CCRC, Karen Nella. I told her what had happened at the harassment trial and explained how I'd been sent to prison because of a CCRC mistake. I was nice to them and suggested that Nicol had been misled by other agencies. A couple of weeks later, I received a response. That the Commissioner's decision could have been influenced by an outside agency was denied and they refused to admit a mistake had been made, but they did tell me the case could be treated as a new application. After speaking to one of their staff and being told it would probably be dealt with quite quickly, I decided to leave them to get on with it. At that time, I was happy to help protect the reputation of the criminal justice system. I didn't hear from them for a couple of months, so I contacted them to find out what was going on. I was told it would be about a year before the cases were reviewed. I wasn't too impressed with that, so I sent them another email. That seemed to have some effect because the name of the commissioner who made the mistake disappeared from the list of commissioners. I wasn't too bothered with what they got up to for the next couple of months because I was busy with other campaign-related activities, but I kept an eye on how long it was taking. One of my grounds for my application in the witness interference case might have been that the defence hadn't been done properly and I would have to prove that that was true. Everything said in court is recorded by a stenographer, but the problem was that the records are only kept for five years. The trial had been taken place in 2009. We were now into spring 2014, but if the CCRC took much longer, it could be that the record of any mistakes made in that trial would be destroyed in July 2014. The CCRC should have ordered that the records of the trial be preserved as soon as they received my application. I began to wonder if they'd done this, so I wrote to them to find out. I told them I knew the name of the company that held the records and it was something I could check, if I needed to. A couple of weeks later, I received their reply. They hadn't ordered the record be preserved when they received my application, but had done so now. A few weeks later, I got another letter from them. Owing to an increase in applications, the review of my case had been put back from December 2014 to October 2015. That would be two and a half years after I first told them their mistake had been responsible for my wrongful imprisonment in 2011. So how long should the CCRC take to review a case? Well, the first point to be made is that my case is an easy one. All the evidence is laid out in the tables you've seen, so it's just a matter of checking the references. It wouldn't take more than a couple of hours to do that. And at that time, the CCRC already had all the other records needed from the original application made in 2011. My application could have been dealt with in a few weeks, and bearing in mind they were responsible for my wrongful imprisonment, it should have been. At that time, cases were taking between 6 and 18 months. They weren't taking two and a half years. 
My problem was that the next general election was due in May 2015, but the CCRC was putting my case review off until after the election. I knew it would be almost impossible for someone who'd been to prison twice to run the campaign, so I had to get the convictions overturned as soon as possible. The question is, is that something the CCRC had considered? Were they putting off my case reviews until after the election so they could be rejected? If they did that, the campaign couldn't run and the truth might never come out. Any attempted cover-up would succeed and the reputation of the legal professions would be saved. Let's have a quick recap of what went wrong, of what had to be covered up. I'd been through three trials. In the first two, the evidence in the written statements clearly showed I was innocent, yet I was convicted. The CPS had clearly failed to do its job properly. A solicitor had made a mistake about the time allowed for an automatic appeal, and that seems to have led to a mistake by a judge. The third case only went to trial because of a mistake made by the Criminal Cases Review Commission the organisation set up by Parliament to put right miscarriages of justice, and that mistake had led to my wrongful imprisonment. All of this has stopped Campaign for Democracy going ahead, a campaign that would have changed the course of British history. Everything, except a bit about Leveson, was sent to the CCRC, but they would have known the Court of Appeal had rejected my application. Cases can't go to the CCRC unless they've been through the Court of Appeal. If there had been a cover-up, the CCRC would have known that it went to the highest levels in the criminal justice system. So what happened? All we know for sure is that the CCRC rejected my application. But did they have a choice? To send my cases back to the Court of Appeal would have meant contradicting Leveson and exposing just how badly things can go wrong in the criminal justice system. Knowing what I do now, I realised that was never going to happen. But I had to go through the processes because now there can be no argument. The British legal system is rotten. There's a lot of good people in it, but there's some rotten apples in that barrel. They need to be removed, but the cover-up culture is deeply embedded in the legal system, so that can't happen. So now to the important bit. Where did that leave Campaign for Democracy? The final rejection by the CCRC should have made it impossible to get the campaign off the ground. No one is going to help a convicted criminal who's been to prison twice start a campaign. What about taking this amazing story to the media? The problem is that getting the story of the legal scandal out also gets the story of the campaign out. When the story of the campaign comes out, it's as good as one, and we get profound and hugely important changes to the way we do things. Any journalist or media organisation telling the story would then be directly responsible for those changes. That's too big for them. They're talkers, not doers, so they're not going to tell the story. I know I've tried them all more than once. Some people might have given up, gone to live somewhere else and started a new life, but I've always known what the campaign could do for Britain. I kept going, and because of that, new opportunities came up. The first was the rise of the internet and social media as a way of getting stories out. The second was that Keir Starmer who was head of the Crown Prosecution Service when the mistakes were being made, became Prime Minister. A past Prime Minister had promised the transfer of sovereignty from politicians to people. The current Prime Minister was mixed up in the biggest legal scandal in British history. I was at the centre of all this, and the means to get the story out were now available. Just five years ago, If you said that Keir Starmer would be our Prime Minister in 2024, the vast majority of people in Britain would have replied, who's Keir Starmer? Before becoming leader of the Labour Party in 2020, he had no track record in government. He didn't even become an MP until 2015. So how did he become Prime Minister just nine years later? It's because he was well known within the Labour Party, not as a politician, but as a barrister specialising in human rights law. The help he gave to activists in 1997, who'd handed out leaflets critical of the McDonald's burger chain, and who were then sued for libel in a major legal case, would have endeared him to every Labour Party member. Long before that, it made clear his concerns about miscarriages of justice. Colleague Gavin Miller QC said, We both came into the profession in the 80s, when there was a generation of young lawyers concerned about miscarriages of justice. 
Starmer's commitment to this problem was also shown when he co-edited a book, Miscarriages of Justice, a Review of Justice in Error. His record led to his appointment as head of the Crown Prosecution Service from November 2008 to 2013, the time when I was being wrongly convicted and imprisoned. After his time as head of the CPS, he decided to pursue a career in politics, and when a safe Labour seat came available in London, Starmer successfully applied to be the candidate in the 2015 election. When he was campaigning to be selected for the seat, Starmer told a reporter, I wanted to be a human rights lawyer to change things for individuals who most needed my legal help and assistance. What I can't stand is when people walk around a problem and can't solve it, so I have resolved not to do that. Just five years after becoming an MP, Starmer became leader of the Labour Party in April 2020. I didn't blame Starmer for the problems I'd had, but it was obvious that if the truth came out, it would be damaging to him and the Labour Party, so I gave him several chances to put things right. On the 8th of September 2020, I posted a package to Starmer that included all the evidence in the original case and a copy of an old 20-minute video, Why the Big Society Didn't Happen, that told the story you're hearing now. That same day, I also wrote to David Evan, then Labour Party General Secretary, and Starmer supporter. I'd hoped with his reputation, Starmer would want to see justice done. There was no reply. A few weeks later, I sent the whole package to Starmer, other than the video, by email. Still no reply. I tried again on the 4th of May 2021 when I wrote to the Chief Constable of David Powers Police. See the video, the Chief Constable. Since then, I've made several attempts to contact him and get this sorted out. I've never received a reply. In an article in The Guardian in January 2020, Stalmer is quoted as saying, I've always been motivated by a burning desire to tackle inequality and injustice, to stand up for the powerless against the powerful. It would have taken courage and integrity to deal with this matter properly, the same qualities we would expect of a Prime Minister. His actions aren't matching the words. This hasn't been a lot of fun for me, but what is more important is what it's meant for Wales and Britain. We've got a housing crisis, an obesity crisis, over two and a half trillion pounds of national debt, insignificant growth, an energy crisis, climate change, and no credible way of dealing with those problems. Britain's political system is a disaster, but there are alternatives. Switzerland is one of the happiest, healthiest and wealthiest countries in the world. I want that Swiss success for Wales and Britain. If we can get the story of the Starmer scandal out, we get the story of the campaign out. And if we can do that, we'll bring about the fundamental changes in the way we do politics we need. Instead of trying to solve problems with the systems we know don't work, we'll be able to look around the world see what works and what doesn't, and bring the best back to Wales and Britain. If you want to see Britain heading in that direction, all you have to do is like, subscribe, comment, and most important of all, share this video. The algorithm will do the rest. Thank you.